Uh, well, thank you, and uh, thank you for this uh, nice invitation to speak here in uh, Edinburgh. Um, so what I will propose today is to look at uh, the development of Gestalt theory uh, and to focus actually on some aspects that are often neglected in the contemporary assessment of the philosophical and psychological uh, relevance of Gestalt theory. So when we look at uh, Gestalt theory today, uh, we find that it is actually uh, recognized, often recognized as a theory that uh, somehow just failed. But some psychologists and some experimental psychologists uh, seem uh, uh, remain interested in Gestalt, uh, and uh, they consider the the importance of Gestalt theory in the framework or in the general set of the uh, perceptual organization. So. Uh, the theories in perceptual organization wants to um, um, answer the question, uh, how does the visual uh, system manage to get from locally meaningless receptors output, receptor outputs to globally meaningful scenes and events in the observer's perceived environment? So this is taken from the foreword to, to the Oxford Handbook on uh, perceptual organization that, was, uh, that has been published uh, last year. And this is the foreword by Palmer. So he uh, identifies so different fields of perceptual organization, the first being computation, uh, ecology, physiology, but also phenomenology. And in the subfield of phenomenology, so to speak, this is where Gestalt theory has something to say. And uh, this was, uh, th this is also the position defended by the editor of, of the volume, uh, uh, Johann Wagemanns, who's uh, an experimental psychologist from uh, Leuven in Belgium, and probably one of the, well, the leading psychologists working today on uh, Gestalt theory uh, on an experimental basis. But it is interesting to uh, look at this book in some details, well, at least for the, for the well, not only for the historical, but, but in this context for the historical, uh, for the, uh, historical reason, because it gives us also uh, the reasons why Gestalt theory succeeded and also the reasons why it failed. So I'm interested here in uh, discussing the reasons why it failed, actually. So why uh, did it succeed? Well, according to, to Wagemanns, but to uh, Palmer as well, the main point of Gestalt theory was to demolish the associative or atomistic conception of perception that was prevailing uh, in 19th century psychology and physiology, but also in early 20th century uh, psychology. So they really changed the uh, paradigm, so to speak. But it failed uh, for uh, other reasons. And the main reason that is presented by uh, Wagemanns and, and uh, Palmer is that, uh, well, they, uh, they couldn't uh, cope with the advances in, uh, of behaviorism and basically the theory or the ID behind the Gestalt goes against uh, a uh, general or a received view of, of, uh, of science, uh, following which we start from general phenomena that we want to explain in more simpler phenomena. Of course, Gestalt theories, or at least the general Gestalt theory of Berlin, uh, goes quite um, uh, along these lines. Uh, and uh, another uh, psychologist, uh, also in a, in a similar volume on perceptual constancy that was published a few years ago, suggested that basically Gestalt psychology had a biased conception of perception. And so this is why basically it failed. But there, are also, there is also another reason, I think, which, uh, which is uh, relevant here, well, well, which interests me and which will play here in this talk uh, some role, is that in my view, the dominance of the Berlin theories of Gestalt over the intentionalist theories of Gestalt played also a significant role because there was an experimental output to these theories uh, in Berlin that was much more successful at the beginnings than uh, the output of the intentionalist theories uh, that were uh, developed in Graz. And so because of this success, I think, um, the narrative that Gestalt theory is uh, going against the, the received view of a dual conception of perception, well, this narrative became the dominant narrative in uh, the history of Gestalt. So people today, and also, also I think uh, Johann Wagemann uh, himself, uh, would uh, be happy to say that, well, the basic uh, characteristic of Gestalt theory, and why is it interesting, it's 
may, precisely because it goes against this conception of uh, uh, this dual conception of perception, according to which we would have first sensory contents and built upon these contents uh, a perception of the forms. So this, I think, uh, explains probably uh, the reasons why it failed, because at some point, when you take all these reasons together, uh, from an historical point of view, well, Gestalt theory has today a limited, uh, uh, a limited extension, one could say. So what I want to suggest is that the discovery and the philosophical importance of Gestalt comes from an investigation on the nature of experience as an explanance uh, of various apparently connected phenomena. And these phenomena are actually almost never studied now in Gestalt theory. These are for uh, first the unity of consciousness, but unity of consciousness at, at a time, but also unity of consciousness over time. Gestalt was conceived as an explanation also for uh, our experience of similarity. So we experience two cubes or two squares as being similar. What is the basic, the basis of the similarity first, and what is the basis of, the, of our experience of similarity? This is also another feature that. Gestalt as an explanance wanted to uh, address. And uh, Gestalt's theory, or the prehistory of Gestalt theory, it's probably more uh, safe to speak that way, wanted also to address uh, the question of uh, uh, how our experience of various kinds of connections uh, is structured, the functional dependence connections, bilateral dependence, one-sided dependence, uh, etc. So I will not go here in the talk on, on, on in the details of all these three explananda, but I will give you a few examples that might uh, illustrate this uh, some, somehow, I think, uh, in a good way. So the explanans, which, uh, which is identified by people like Ernst Mach and uh, Christian von Ehrenfels, is the connection between the structure of experience and the structure of perceived object. So this is basically the, this is the starting point of Gestalt theory, or if you prefer, of the prehistory of Gestalt theory. But basically, uh, Gestalt was uh, the, uh, conceived as this explanant for the various explananda I just listed here. And so, as I suggested already uh, in, in the introduction, the experimental success of the Berlin model gave to Gestalt theory the reputation of being at bottom a theory of perception and also, of course, of perceptual organization. But the theory is more general, and I will try to show it in the uh, last, in, in the next few slides. So I will first go, um, I will first say a few things on the varieties of uh, mutual dependence on the prehistory of Gestalt in Brentano and Mach, on the varieties of mutual dependence in Ehrenfels and Meinung, and I will just, uh, give a few uh, details on the opposition between these two conceptions of Gestalt, as we see in Graz and Berlin. And uh, I will then uh, discuss the Berlin ID that Gestalt are to be conceived of as unitary processes. And I will uh, close with a few remarks on emotions. And my point here is basically to say that when we look at v these very complex phenomena that are emotions, we see that uh, a strict analysis in the sense of the, uh, of the Gestalt theory in the Berlin model has some deficiencies that uh, can be probably uh, uh, put aside when we use an intentional model. So this is basically an historical reconstruction, but of course I have a few uh, opinions that I will put here and there, so it's not basically or, or essentially historical. So. Uh, as I said, the, the historical starting point is to be found in uh, the philosophy of Brentano and Mach. And these are actually two very different uh, thinkers and two di very different philosophers, and they have very different metaphysical views. But uh, on this aspect, on the, the, the constitution or the structure of content, of mental content, they have very similar ideas. So the first, the first idea that, that, is, that started, so to speak, the, uh, the question or, or the idea that we have gestalt in perception, and we have gestalt also in our experience of the forms, uh, is in uh, Ernst Mach's uh, small paper on uh, the physiology of seeing. Uh, 
Mach wants to answer two questions in this paper. The first is, why do we recognize a transposed melody easier than its tonality? And how do we come to recognize different geometrical forms as instances of one and the same form? So these are the two questions he wants to uh, answer. So the main hypothesis he's presenting in this, in this paper could be summarized in, in this quote. Uh, Mach uh, writes, just as the same differently colored form uh, forms, the same muscular sensation must occur if the forms are to be recognized as the same. So to each and every form, each and every abstraction, as one might say, must in just the same way. This is also, this is important. This is the, the, the connection Mach is here uh, making. Uh, each form, each uh, and every as one might say, must just in the same way be based upon presentations of a quite particular quality. This holds true for space and shape, as well as for time, rhythm, pitch, the form of melodies, intensities, and so on. So the basic idea which is formulated here is that there is a necessary connection between uh, the structure of muscular sensations and the structure of the perceived form. So the starting point for Mach is to explain the basis of the similarity between A and B, let's say, between uh, two cubes or two squares that we perceive so in different uh, settings, and what allows us to recognize A and B as similar. So this is the connection Mach is identifying. He says, well, there must be a connection since we perceive uh, the transposition of the melody easier than uh, simply its tonality. So there is a phenomenon here which is empirically proven, so to speak, and uh, there must be an explanation for it. So the hypothesis is the Gestalt. 20 years later, he will, uh, he will write his very influential book on the analysis of sensations. And of course, I could have uh, quoted many pages from this book, but I think this quote gives us also a few more informations on what kind of connections are involved here. So what kind of necessary connection uh, is involved? So Mach writes, colors, sounds, temperatures, pressures, spaces, times, and so forth are connected with one another in manifold ways. So there are different types of connections. And with them are associated moods of mind, feelings, and volitions. So the content of, of the form, so to speak, is agenced in, in many different kind of connections. This is the one, the one part. But the other part is that there is an association with the uh, emotions, with the presentations, with the moods, the feelings, well, the, the mental phenomena. Uh, so there is an association between the forms and the, um, and the, the feelings, the moods, and uh, the presentations so the mental life, basically. Out of this fabric, that which is uh, relatively more fixed and permanent, stands prominently forth and graves itself in the memory and expresses itself in language. So, of course, I'm not going into the details of Mach's position about different perspectives that we have on one and a single thing, because Mach had this idea, uh, Mach also spoke of uh, muscular sensations. But for him, muscular sensations is just when you're interested in a physiological investigation, the phenomena you're investigating, you're investigating are muscular sensations. But when you switch to psychology, you will call the same basic phenomena uh, mental presentations or something like this. For him, it wasn't an issue because uh, he thought that uh, we have these distinctions because we take different perspectives on uh, the subject matter. But of course, for people like Brentano, one year after Mach, the situation was a little bit different because uh, Brentano has this ID that is, uh, that, uh, that is still today very influential that mental acts are actually characterized by their direction towards an object. So acts are related first to a content, a mental content, which mediates, so to speak, uh, our relation to the object. So when, when I'm presenting the table or when I'm presenting a blue patch, there is a presented blue patch, so to speak, in my mind. Brentano had this imminent view on intentionality. And thanks to this uh, imminent content, I'm directed toward this blue patch which exists in the outer world. So we have, what is interesting here is that where uh, 
Mach speaks of simply of a necessary connection and of relations of dependence. Brentano says a little bit more. Brentano says that we have a correlation between the presentation and uh, the presented or the content. So what it, uh, what it means is that the structure of what you have in the, in the presented X, so to speak, must represent somehow the structure that what, uh, of what you have in the act part of the whole intentional relations. So this was Brentano's ID. Brentano uh, also, of course, has some restrictions in his theory. Of course, for Brentano, there are no mental states. There are no uh, beliefs as we consider them, as we conceive of them today, as uh, uh, mental states that have some temporal extension. But acts, in his view, are punctual. So it is, of course, a problem when it comes to explain the unity of consciousness over time. If you perceive a melody, um, but you only have a now point as your consciousness of the melody, so how can you reconstruct, so to speak, the whole melody in your, in your mind? So this is a problem I will not be addressing here, but Brentano has a nice solution that uh, also Husserl will uh, take over some years later. Uh, but this is another topic. So, uh, so Brentano has these punctual acts and with them have, uh, uh, has mental operations like abstraction, attention, generalization, which actually organize the content. But it must be also, uh, we, we must keep in mind that this structure of correlation basically means that the structure of what you have in the content is, a, so to speak, a representation of what you what what your what the structure of your experience is, so in the problem of unity of consciousness at the time. So just to make it simpler, not to go with the consciousness, uh, the unity of consciousness over time, you can have a presentation, for example, of different objects at the time, uh, the cup and the table and and uh, another object. You have at this time you have a consciousness according to Brentano, which is uh, unified. It's not simply a, a series of uh, mental presentations that you have, but you have a unity of these presentations. But if you, uh, if you take this correlation seriously, then the structure of the content must depict somehow the structure of the unity of consciousness. So here Brentano uh, didn't write very much on, on the structure of presented unity. He will speak most, most, most of the time he will speak of, about relations, about, uh, about the, the, the partial content and the relations between one another, but he didn't go into uh, more details. But this will change with uh, Ehrenfels, with the students of Brentano, with Ehrenfels and uh, Alexius Meinong. So when Brentano in 1887 presented, because I'm uh, uh, suggesting the date of 1887 because this was the first lecture on descriptive psychology where Brentano exposed this theory in full details, uh, also his theory of uh, time consciousness. And it was a very influential lecture because uh, Ehrenfels attended to these lectures, uh, Husserl had uh, the whole copies of the notes from his uh, fellow uh, students uh, of the lectures, and the lectures uh, lasted over three years. So this is a very uh, this is a very important and influential uh, lecture set that Brentano held in 1887 until 1891, and this is also the project I am working on in Salzburg. So I'm not going to speak uh, about it now, but it is uh, it is a very crucial and seminal. Uh, lecture uh, that Brentano held at that time. A lecture that influenced both uh, Ehrenfels and Meinong. Meinong was already in 87 in Graz and was somehow uh, uh, detached from Brentano. They had also personal issues, but, um, but he had a good friend, Alois Höfler, who attended the lectures and gave him also copies of these notes. So what uh, Ehrenfels will then develop, inspired by both Ernst Mach and Brentano, is the idea that, gestalt, that, that, that there is a quality in the structure of our content. You have these different partial contents, the, let's say the single tones of the melody. 
but you have beside the, the, the specific quality of each of these tones, you have a gestalt quality, so a quality of the whole, which is different than the sum of its parts. So this was basically uh, Ehrenfeld's uh, Ehrenfels ID, which will be also taken over by his teacher Meinong, and which will be developed in the Grazer theory. So the basic ID by Ehrenfeld is that gestalt manifests itself differently than the manifestation of its parts, as something different, and that the gestalt is a whole which is different from the sum of its part. This is something different, which is called today uh, often a suprasumativity, so something being more than the sum of its parts. I'm sorry for these transitions. I switched to PowerPoint and it looks like, like very uh, sophisticated, but it wasn't <laughs> meant that way. So uh, as I said, uh, Ehrenfels and um, and Brentano had, uh, 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 sorry, Mach and Brentano had different views on, on, on metaphysics, uh, basically on uh, how is, uh, reality is constructed. And so for Ehrenfels too, who uh, also has the same position as Brentano, um, the correlation that holds, uh, doesn't hold between muscular sensations and contents, but with uh, uh, partial presentations and their content. So muscular sensations are not involved uh, in the picture in Ehrenfels's theory. But, uh, and also another point is that the unitary structure of experience according to, um, to Ehrenfels is not to be understood in the terms of Mach's theory of element. So the Gestalt is a supplementary uh, element, so to speak, a plus which is over and above the parts. Think of the melody and uh, as the gestalt and the single tones as the, as the part. So the melody is more a plus over and above the part. And this is not to be considered as Mach also suggested it uh, as auxiliary objects for thought. So Mach will say, well, we can speak of a gestalt instead of speaking of the single tones as long as it is useful for the theory. So this is not uh, Ehrenfels's idea. Meinong starts also, so was very influenced by, by Ehrenfeld's uh, short essay on Gestalt qualities from 1890 and developed from early on, so around 1891, but this example with the four nuts is from 1899. The idea that actually when we perceive a form, what is going on is a, phenomen is a phenomenon similar to uh, what Husserl will call later categorical intuition, where you have, of course, you have the sensory elements that are there. You perceived uh, the nuts. Uh, you perceive one, two, and three, and four nuts. But the, you, you don't perceive the property of being four or the fear height. So Meinung suggests that uh, we should consider this as a founded object, uh, which needs something more than a mere sum. So it will present the perception of properties as some, uh, uh, the, perception of, the perception of properties as, a, as a, an example for the general case of perceptions of Gestalt. So perception of Gestalts needs a higher order act and uh, this is necessary to perceive the property of being for. So both Ehrenfels and Meinong uh, share a view about this correlation between experiences between the structure of experiences and the perception of Gestalt. So let's say you perceive, you have two experiences, uh, experiences E1 and E2, where you perceive uh, two similar blue squares, uh, uh, so in different setting. And uh, well, if we want to very simplify the picture, we could say that, well, these are Gestalt or these are uh, objects which have, uh, for example, properties of having four right angles and having a blue surface. And so in these two experiences, you uh, isolate, so to speak, these, these, uh, these features, but these features build the parts of a general whole, which is the Gestalt blue, blue square, and which is identified as being similar. So the similarity, uh, uh, we perceive similarity, so to, to speak simply, we perceive similarity because we perceive that these features uh, um, are parts of a general whole, which is the blue cube. 
But in order to perceive that, there must be also, this is the point uh, of Ehrenfels and also of Brentano, there must be a correlation, and so is the experience structured. So your two different experiences are also two uh, parts of a single whole. So this holds for a spatial form, but um, Ehrenfels was very optimistic and wanted uh, to generalize the theory, but he never really did it, in a multisensorial uh, gestalt. For example, he suggested to consider humidity as a gestalt of uh, pressure and temperature, or even of multimodal gestalts, where you would have uh, smells and memory that would be, so to speak, part of a whole, and uh, this would be also uh, uh, this would be also uh, in the uh, structure of our experience. So this is uh, the starting point, I would say, of, of Gestalt, perhaps the end of the prehistory of Gestalt. The idea is that you have this correlation and you have a mutual dependence between the structure of experience and the uh, structure of the Gestalt, and you have also bilateral dependence in the structure of the perceived form itself. So where it changes is uh, when Meinong started to introduce the ID, well, he already introduced it in, in 1891 and 1899 also, but uh, where he started to introduce the ID that there is uh, some activity of the subject involved in Gestalt perception. So Ehrenfeld, as I said, uh, suggested that the Gestalt uh, is, so to speak, beside the elements uh, of content, so they are their quality, their general quality, so to speak. Meinong suggested to see the Gestalt as uh, a founded content uh, based on foundational content, the sensory content. But he introduces in uh, 91 the hypothesis that there must be a, an activity of the subject involved in uh, Gestalt perception. So we presuppose, this is a quote from uh, is, uh, is essay of 1891, we presuppose that the subject following motives that are not arbitrary but really objective first connected sounds into a group and that a founded content seems to be able to emerge from the musical phrase. So he already had in, in 1891 this idea of, a, of an activity of the subject. Uh, this is central for the uh, for the production theory, because production theory basically says that we produce uh, Gestalt. This is, of course, uh, oversimplistic, but it is basically the, the idea. So one uh, other student of mine, on Rudolf Amiseder in 1901, who was very promising but ended as a librarian, uh, sadly, uh, uh, had this theory, uh, uh, so tried to systematize uh, Meinong's ID in a distinction between two different perceptual modes. So he suggested uh, that we present real object perceptively and that the relations between them obtained by psychological necessity, but that we present ideal objects fundatively, even in German it sounds weird, uh, relations between them uh, obtained by logical necessity and which kind of activity is involved. This is the production. So production is the act of producing contents which are in relation of mapping um, this is the best translation I could find of Zuordnung or, correla or Correlation. These are the, the, the terms that are used by Amiseder and Meinon with the founded objects. So we have uh, two perceptual modes, the sensory perception and the productive perceptions for uh, non-sensory objects. This uh, brings an interesting, so this distinction was at the basis of, a, of, an, of an interesting discussion which actually started, so to speak, the war between Graz and, and Berlin on the nature of Gestalt. And uh, this distinction of two modes brought uh, another student of Meinong, uh, Vittorio Benussi, to suggest that there is an under underdetermination of the productive mode versus the sensory mode. So there is some kind of ambiguity. Uh, Benussi's idea was that when you perceive this um, uh, this picture by uh, Pierre Crusser of the uh, L'Urne Mysterieuse, the uh, mysterious urn, uh, well, you have what we call today, since uh, Rubin who actually uh, got his ID from uh, Crusser, what we see is some kind of gestalt switch. So how do you uh, explain that? So Benussi suggests to say, uh, su suggests to see there that we have um, a, a constant, 
determination on the sensory perception. So when you see the, the urn or when you see the, the faces, I mean, the sensory content remains constant. So there's nothing that changes. It's not like your eyes are like turning or something. It's, it's just exactly the same setting in, uh, in, perceptual, uh, in, in, the perce in the sensory perceptual uh, situation. But that the gestalt, because of the switch, to the object of higher order is underdetermined and that the content is uh, fully determined. So that was the idea. So um, Benussi suggested to add as a property of gestalt that they are uh, constitutively ambiguous. So gestalt are not, uh, 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 don't have, so to speak, their interpretation built in, but you have some interpretation of the form, and they have, because of this, you have some ambiguity that is constitutive of Gestalt. So the, the idea or the argument that Benussi uh, uh, sketches in his uh, Gesetze der inadequaten Gestalt of Fassung from 1914 is that if one accepts that for a constant complex of sensory impressions, presentations of completely different objects are awakened, so this was the case with the picture, then these presentations cannot come to existence through the activity of a sense, as it is the case with, sensory, with the sensory stimulation of the eye, from which results the presentation of a particular color. Therefore, between sensory impressions which remain constant and the presentation of figures which may differ from one another, there must be some process X, which uh, I quote, depending on its development and under and notwithstanding the presupposition of constant sensory impressions, leads to presentations of completely different objects. It is evident that this process cannot, uh, cannot be a sensory process, since this process is determinant for the absence of a determinate gestalt presentation in the case mentioned above. Such a presentation should be called uh, extrasensory, also außersinnlich. Um, so this is basically what uh, Wolfgang Köhler will uh, uh, describe as a case, a typical case of what he, what he calls, of course, in a pejorative way, the constancy hypothesis. So Köhler uh, comments on, on, not exactly on this paper, but on an earlier one which already had the argument. So Köhler comments on Benussi by saying, the way in which one applies this kind of explanation might well be very useful in order to maintain the constancy of the laws of stimuli and in order to provide this young science with an early systematization. On the other hand, the concrete effect of such an aid, which guarantees systematicity, is often and only to discredit fundamentally the, observer, uh, the observations and the fresh will to go further. So strictly speaking, Kulov sees in, in, in uh, Benussi's strategy simply a theoretical construct in order to, to keep, to, to build a very complex theory that will explain a phenomenon, but which actually put aside uh, the observations. And this was, of course, uh, the approach made by uh, Köhler and the, the Berlin School. So the basic conflict could be summarized in this way. So for Benussi, uh, uh, if you take a perceived image as a whole in two different situations, then the gestalt is ambiguous. For Kafka, who goes along uh, with Köhler in this, in this sense, the percept varies both as a function of internal and external conditions as a whole. So what you have with these two levels of perception in, 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 the Graz, in the Graz school is that they are not really interacting. So you have the sensory uh, level, which is basically in a, in a strict metaphysical relation of foundation, which is founding the, uh, 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 the, uh, the level of intellectual or emotional or higher order acts. So, but you cannot have, so to speak, an interaction between both these, uh, these levels. So the interaction is not thematized. So what changes with, with the Berlin theory is precisely that uh, the focus on this interaction between internal and external conditions as a whole. And so uh, Kafka suggests if one abandons the, con the constancy hypothesis, then the percept becomes homogeneous again. And Benussi's ambiguity, the Gestalt Mehrdeutigkeit, is simply the fact that uh, the percept is a function of a plurality of variables. So uh, 
it has been uh, often depicted, uh, the conflict between Graz and Berlin has often been depicted like with these uh, functions here of perception where uh, for Berlin, uh, external and internal factors are engaged into one single function, while in Graz, perception is a function of these, is, a, is actually a function of internal and external factor, which are, uh, cons which are actually two different functions. Uh, so, or another way to put it, uh, uh, just to emphasize here on this distinction, the Grazer theory is actually based on the intentional model of perception. This is really a way of, uh, of keeping this distinction that Brentano introduced between uh, acts and contents and the correlation or the, the mapping relation, if you like. And this is basically a, vari a, a, a variation on the intentional model of Brentano. So the Gestalt are actually a kind of intentional objects. While in the Berlin theory, uh, uh, they emphasize on the dynamic structure of the whole. Since the environment plays an important role, the relevance of the intentionality of perception is relativized. So the responses of the organism to the pattern of stimuli uh, play the dominant role in the characterization of the explanants of our explananda. So this is basically, I think, the moment where the Gestalt theory really uh, uh, in two direct, two different directions. Uh, Benussi continued. I will say a few things more on Benussi later. But Benussi continued and keep, kept uh, his, his conception of uh, production as uh, as an essential process for Gestalt. But of course. Uh, the conception, the Berlin conception of Gestalt as unitary processes, so involving both internal and external factors, became uh, around 1914 and in the early 20s already the dominant view on uh, Gestalt uh, theory. So I think this gives a very nice uh, 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 account of, of what Köhler has in mind with, with his conception of Gestalt. This is taken from his book from 1947. Uh, Kuller uh, says, uh, our view will be that instead of reacting to local stimuli by local and mutually independent events, the organism responds to the pattern of stimuli to which it is exposed. And that this answer is a unitary process, a functional whole, which gives an experience a sensory scene rather than a mosaic of local sensations. Only from this point of view uh, can we explain the fact that with a constant local stimulus, local experience is found to uh, vary when the surrounding stimulation is changed. So uh, we have, as, as uh, I already said, a function which is involving both internal and external factors. So uh, the, the organism response plays here also an important role in the structure of the Gestalt. So this idea was developed also by Kurt Levin in his field theory, and also in Kurt Levin's school uh, uh, of, uh, of psychology, uh, in his theory also of environment. Of course, Gibson is uh, also connected with this, uh, with this conception of Gestalt. Uh, the concept of suprasimitivity also has been developed by Erwin Rausch, which uh, which is a later psychologist and we, who also was influenced by the Berlin Gestalt and uh, by Felix Krüger also. So this is, so to speak, a monistic conception of perception, which rejects the distinction between the two levels. And uh, Kofka also made this point against Benussi, which uh, you probably already know, that ambiguity is not a sufficient condition for the distinction between sensory and cognitive levels. There is actually ambiguity even at the sensory level. So there was first this accusation that the constancy hypothesis was a theoretical construct. So this is the first point against the, uh, against the Graz school from the, uh, coming from the Berlin school. But uh, this is actually a more interesting point by, uh, made here by Kofka. This is the problem of simultaneous contrast. So if you say, so think about the picture we've seen of, of, the, of the mysterious urn and look now at this other picture. So if you say that there is ambiguity uh, in the Gestalt because the sensory uh, field is constant or the sensory contents are always constant, then you can take this picture, this is Kafka's idea, you can take this picture of the simultaneous contrast and you see that the small 
uh, squares from right looks brighter than the uh, small square left, although they are actually the same. Uh, they, they, there is no contrast. I mean, there is, they are simply the same color. So what should Benussi answer to that? Well, this is pretty complicated because here we have an example where it's very hard to say there is a cognitive level which, so to speak, reconstruct the difference. Uh, Benussi's answer was, uh, uh, was to say that there is, uh, there is an aberration of the sensory perceptual su uh, system. Uh, Kafka said, well, it must be anal analyzed in the framework of a dynamical system. So this is a quotation from is uh, Grundlegung der Wahrnehmung Psychologie from 1913, I think, that a real object can act as a stimulation only relatively to an organism is not in question. Benussi speaks of existing physical processes which, from our point of view, are stimuli. But if a thing is a stimulus only relatively to an organism on which it has an effect, then the kind of stimulus it is, and if it is a stimulus, doesn't depend only on the thing. When the organism is changed, then the stimulus quality of the thing is changed too. Um, so that was, I think, a, a very difficult problem. The, the, the simultaneous contrast was a very difficult problem for Benussi. Um, and if you take, for example, the Necker cube, so uh, now I'm, I'm relying on manuscripts by Benussi that uh, are still not published, but. Uh, when you look at the Necker cube, so how will you explain that sometimes you see the Necker cube coming from down to right and from up to left? So um, is there really a cognitive process here involved in the switch of the perception of the cube? Of course, here these are basically just ways of focusing on the Necker cube, but of course we don't need two on the side and just have to be patient and then switch. But Um, so, Benussi's answer will be that there, uh, there is actually, or there must be, some uh, unconscious uh, processes that, that goes on the cognitive level. But he wasn't also satisfied very much with this answer. And then in the manuscript, he, he started to uh, uh, um, uh, take uh, Husserl's, in, uh, Husserl's analysis and constitution and the constitution of experience in order to explain these phenomena. So this is also an interesting strategy that Benussi developed, but uh, I mean, I don't have time now to discuss this. So let me close now with a few remarks on emotions. So as I said, I think that um, I think that the Gestalt theory, the way it developed, of course, had uh, on the Berlin side most success on the experimental basis. Uh, and I think the arguments that are offered by the Gestalt theorists are, are basically experimental arguments saying that, well, uh, uh, in case of optical illusions or uh, in case of, uh, of for, for example, the Necker cube or simultaneous contrast, we have here cases where well, your theory, uh, your intellectual model, uh, Graz, uh, is not really working. But in the case of more complex phenomena like emotions, it's not so uh, obvious, in my, my view at least, it's not so obvious that the Grazer model is not, uh, is not relevant anymore. So the Grazer model of emotions is actually a cognitive theory of emotions, which is also today very popular. So that the idea is that emotions are directed towards objects, that they have a quality of experience, uh, an Erlebnis quali uh, qualität, so in terms of pleasure or displeasure, that they presuppose uh, acts of knowledge, so that, so to speak, they are built on acts of knowledge, and that uh, there are also uh, imaginary emotions or make-believe emotions. This is an idea that Meinung developed in many of his, of his writings. So this, this double structure actually is not completely uninteresting when it comes to emotions because, of, of course, when you deal with imaginary emotions, um, there is something highly intellectual in this. I mean, you have to, if you, if you look at a Shakespeare play and you are, uh, you are moved by uh, some of the uh, action going on, there is something happening here that is of, a, of an intellectual nature. I think it is hardly disputable. And I think also that the Grazer model here can take that phenomena 
very good in account, very well, but it's not clear exactly how they will, uh, how the, 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 how the Berlin theory can take that into account. So, um, so this is basically just a repetition of what I've, uh, what I've just said. The Berlin uh, theory of emotions is, of course, uh, is not surprising, a dynamical theory. Emotions are considered as holes of action or Handlungsganze. Uh, for example, if we take uh, hunger, in, in according to Levine's theory of, of, uh, of emotions, the need to eat liberates energy and attributes a value to the need. So one feel physical symptoms or think of eating, and eating thereby obtains a positive value from this concrete situation and also as a function of the uh, uh, level of hunger. So the, the, the emotion is, so to speak, considered as a vectorial force, this is formulated in V here, which is a function of the person and its environment, so person and umfeld. So the Gestalt is the totality of, vari of variables of persons and situations which plays a role at a given time. So the needs condition a system which seeks satisfaction, and the system interacts naturally with the perception of the environment. So we see here in, in this general a uh, description of what emotions are, and especially here, uh, feelings like, like hunger. Uh, we see here that the structure is, is a general structure in which both the person and, in, and uh, the structure of its experience is involved as interacting with the actual content of what is perceived. So there is no distinction, and the, function, and the emotion is uh, considered as, as a, a whole of action. And one of the uh, of Levin's most promising students, uh, uh, Tamara Dembo, uh, wrote a very interesting paper in 1931 based on uh, Levin's theory, but focusing here on the case of anger. So she describes anger as uh, wanting to attain an objective and being able, unable to do so. Uh, well, she, she says that wanting to attain an objective and being unable to do so doesn't necessarily lead to anger, and it's not is essential trait. So this is a typical, this description is a typical intentional description, but what Dembo suggests is that it's not really actually an essential trait of anger. So to which extent uh, the question of the analy analyzability or not of the elements of effective experiences and sensations, emotions, and volative experiences plays an inessential role for dynamical problems and for the external and heterogeneous behaviors in which one can document anger. So the, the, the intentional models doesn't give us uh, enough materials to, uh, to take dynamical problems into consideration. It's interesting also that uh, Dembo uh, and, and Levin were both uh, uh, from, the, from the Berlin School were also uh, related with Karl Stumpf, who was a student of Brentano and who was, so to speak, the founder of the Berlin School. Uh, and so it's interesting to see that Robert Musil, for example, also in his, uh, in his book, uh, The Men Without Qualities, also take over these analysis of Dembo and Levine. And it is also not surprising because uh, Musil was a student of Karl Stumpf, so he was also he knew these, uh, these philosophers, these uh, psychologists uh, and the psychologist school of uh, Levine. So when you, when you look at these descriptions, I will not quote them here, I will just put them uh, on the picture. Uh, when you look at these description of emotions, Musil is really taking the, uh, the Levine position, and which is, of course, uh, an interesting position because it, it takes into consideration the, the, the context and the, the, uh, and the, the importance of, uh, of its influence on our, on our behavior, but it, it leaves aside completely the intentional structure of uh, our perception. So just uh, to cl a closing remark, because it already has been very long, so I don't want to take too much time. But there was an interesting critique by Sartre of this approach of Gestalt theory, and he was actually taking Tamara Dembo as his uh, target, so to speak. 
Well, in his, in his sketch on the theory of emotion, he says, I understand that for Dembo and the psychologist of form, the passage from the state of inquiry to the state of anger is explained by the breaking of one form and the reconstitution of another. And I understand the breaking of the form problem without a solution in a very strict sense. But how can I admit the appearing of another form? It must be thought of as being clearly given as the substitute of the first. It exists only in relation to the first. Therefore, there is a single process, namely transformation of form. But I cannot understand, this is the most important part, but I cannot understand this transformation without first supposing consciousness, which alone, by its synthetic activity, can break and reconstitute forms ceaselessly. It alone can account for the finality of emotions. As soon as it is a question of setting up a connection from the world to the self, we can lo no longer be content with a psychology of form. So I think this, this point has been made by many different people uh, in the phenomenological tradition, coming from Sartre, coming from, uh, from uh, people defending a conception of pre-reflexive self-consciousness also, that there is a, an activity of consciousness which, of course, uh, uh, is in relation with the forms and uh, which is important in our investigation of the connection between the world and the self. And I think here uh, part of the answer to Sartre's comment would be to go back to the uh, Gestalt theory of, uh, of Graz because they give us an account of what is the relation between the self and, uh, and the Gestalt, uh, this is basically a production relation, but it is part of, uh, of the general theory of intentionality. So what I wanted to say is not uh, that we should go back to Graz's theory, because it would be just uh, switching just one side to another side. And I think both sides are, are, for different reasons, unsatisfactory. But what I wanted to point out is that Basically, the, gest the idea of Gestalt theory is to answer the question of how our experience is related with the world. And this is a, this is a metaphysical question also, and this was also considered as, as such a question by people in Graz and people in Berlin. And probably the interest that we have today in, uh, in experimental psychology for Gestalt is certainly something positive, but it is just focusing on one single aspect of Gestalt theories. And this aspect was also probably one of the reasons for its insuccess. Thank you.